tagad vajadzētu būt visam kārtībā. Var jūs, ka pandēmija ir beigusies, un visi tie, visi tās prasmes, ko es ieguvu, zūmā ir kaut kur izplēnējušas. Tā tad sakam no jauna. Tātad man interesē tieši šī taisnija starp tautām, gan oficiāli, gan neoficiāli atzīti cilvēki, kas nācijas okupācijas laikā ir glābuši ebrejus. Es zinu situāciju Latvijā, un man bija ļoti interesanti arī uzzināt, kā tad tas ir Ukrainā. Man par patīkam pārsteigumu atklājās, ka Ukraina ir skaidri ziņā ceturtā tā, valsts, kurā ir visvairāk taisnie starp tautām, tieši Izrēla atzītiem. Tas ir tas arī pirmais, pirmais skaitlis 2173. Vēl vairāk glābēju ir tikai Polijai, Nīderlandē un Francijai. Latvijā ir 138 šādi cilvēki, bet no Latvijā arī bija daudz mazāk ebreju. Bet Ukrainai nepietiek viena ar, ar, ar šādu pagodinājumu ebreju glābējiem, jo ne visi cilvēki, kuri ebrejiem palīdzēja, var izturēt vai šo lielo tādu atsijāšanu, kā tas notiek Izrēlā, nu, piemēram, ja vīrs izglāba sievu, viņš nevar saņemt šādu titulu. Um, ja, ja ir kāda naudas apmaiņa bijus, tad arī vismaz 60. gados noteikti šādi cilvēku nevarēja ap, apbalvot ar taisno starp tautām titulu. Un tāpēc uk, Ukraina, uh, Ukraina ir radījusi pati savu taisno starp tautām uh, tādu pagodinājumu, ko sauc Ukrainas taisnie. Ir arī atsi, atsevišķi babiņjāras taisnie, kas uh, apkopo tā, to, tos cilvēku, Kas, kas glāba ebrejas tieši Kīvā, un vēl pavisam jauna tāda parādība, es esmu dzirdējis, ka arī Latvijā šādas idejas virmo gaisā ir īpaši pagodināt arī taisno starp tautām dēlus un meitas, tad ir jābūt cilvēkam dzimušam nevēlākā 43. gadā un pat kā mazulim jābūt bijušam nāves briesmās vecāku izvēles dēļ, jo, protams, arī Ukrainā līdzīgi kā Polijā, Baltkrievijā, arī šeit Latvijā, Lietuvā mēs atrodam tādus piemērs, kur cilvēki ir samaksājuši ar dzīvībām par to, ka ir izrādījuši laipnību un, un paglābuši vai nu kādu kaimiņu vai skolas biedru vai, vai kolēģi vai pavisam svešinieku um, ebrei izcelsmas cilvēku. Un pēdējais apbalvotais tieši Izrēlā um, ironiski ir 2000 22. gadu februāri īsi pirms Krievijas iebrukuma Ukrainā. Runājot par taisniem starp tautām, tieši tiem, ko, kurus uzteica Izrēle, kurus apbalvo Izrēle, ir jāpiemina Marija Babiča, kuri pati pat pirmā sieviete, pirmais, pirmā Ukraiņa izcēlesmes sieviete un cilvēks kā tāds, kuru, kuru apbalvo ar taisno starp tautām tieši Izrēla. Ļoti interesants stāsts. Marija holokaust brīdī paglābja, no holokaust paglāba mazu meitnīti, iritu. Diemžēl visi rada izņemot tēti, kurš bija sarkanī armijā gāja bojā. Un Un viņa viņu glāba visus šos četrus gadus, kamēr draud briesmas. Un pēc kāra, kad Irītas teicis atgriežās no kāra, viņš atklāja, ka visi ir mīruši izņemot šo viņu meitiņu. Un pateicībā viņš Mariju būtībā padara par tādu kā ģimenes locekli, kā tanti, kā, kā auģu mamma. Un viņu visi pārceļas uz dzīvi Izrēlā. Ļoti īpaši ir arī stāsts, ka vēl pirms viņi ir apbalvot ar, ar, ar šo medaļu, ar šo titulu, Marija uzaicina iestādīt kociņu taisno alajā Jeruzalemē. Ir arī saglabājušās fotogrāfijas no šī, šī mirkļa. Un kad sieviete nomirs, tad viņu apglabā pareizi ticīko klosterī, kas atrodas Izrēlā. Tā kā tiešām tāds skaists arī svēts varētu teikt nobeigums viņas dzīvē. 
Uh, vēl viens cilvēks, ko mēs, uh, jo man ļoti patīk meklēt paralēles starp to, ko es zinu par Latviju un uh, kā, kas ir noticis uh, Ukrainā. Un uh, man uzmanību pievērs uh, šis cilvēks, kurš uh, tiek atzīst par pirmo Ukrainas taisno. Uh, un tas ir uh, Aleksejs Glakoļevs ar ģimeni, uh, kuri uh, baznīcā, viņš izmanto uh, to, to ka, ir, ka ir mācītājs, uh, ka viņš var uh, izsniegt fiktīvas patiesībā kristam zīmes cilvēkiem, uh, un viņš glab ebrejus. Taču pirms es pastāstu vairāk par šo gadījumu un gribējās uzteikt arī ir viņa tēti, kurš ir mīras 37. gadā, tātad nekāds ne, neko holokaustā viņš nav varonīgi varējis izdarīt, taču viņa varonība un viņa gara spēks paglāba ebrejas 5. gadā un pēc tam 13. gadā. 5. gadā draudēja izcelties pogromi, kas ir tā baisa parādība, kad pūlis metas virsū ebreju veikaliņiem, ebreju mājām var nogalināt izvaro cilvēkus. Naidā aklās dusmās un, un, un tad arī tumsonībā, jo bieži vien šie šāda pogroma tika um, izraisīti dēļ baumām, ka atkal ir pazūdus kāds kristiešu bērniņš, jo ebrejiem vajag tās kristiešu asins matcām. Nu, lūk, un piektā gadā Aleksandrs Galagoļevs vienkārši nostājās šādu pūļu priekšā. Ir dažādas liecības, kur viņš vienkārši nostājies un ar savu gara spēku ir apturējis pūli. Citā versijā saka, ka viņa, viņš saka liturģiskos dziedājumus un tāpēc aptur šo, šo pūli, ka atmostās viņā šajā pūlī arī kāda kristīgā sirdsevziņa. Un interesants ir arī fakts, ka Aleksandru Goļievu noteikti pazīst arī tie cilvēki, kas ir izlasījuši Bulgāko balto glārdi pašā sākumā, kur, kur turbins ierodas pie viņa, viņam ir tāda melnas vītra dzīvē sākusies no mērķas mamma, un ir jaušams pilsoņu kara tuvums, un viņš prasa mācītājiem padomu. Un man likās, ka šie vārdi tā kaut kā zīmīgi ieskanas arī šī, šā, šā brīža situācija, un ir kā varbūt mierinājums tām sajūtām, ko mēs varbūt tagad jūtam. Un viņš saka, ka grūtsirdībai padoties nedrīkst. Padošanās grūtsirdībai ir liels krēks. Tā, tad um, ir jākustās, ne tikai jā, šausmās jāsastīngst. Nu, lūk, un Glagoļeva ģimene, šeit arī ir šie bērni, kas arī ir gan Izraelā taisnie, starp tautām atzīti, gan arī ir šie taisno bērni. Pats jaunākais kā reiz Marija arī paspēja piedzimt tajā 43. gadā. Uh, un man ļoti patīk stāsti par nepaklausīgajiem, ja tāpēc uh, Aleksijs ir fantastisks piemērs šai nepaklausībai un ironiski, ka viņš tomēr ir karīdznieks, tātad teorētiski viņam būtu bijis jābūt nu, ļoti paklausīgam cilvēkam, bet viņš tāds nav. Viņš dzīvo laikā, kad padomju vārā Ukrainā ir būtībā pieteikusi karu garīdzniecībai, tiek jaukti dievnam vajāti garīdznieki, arī viņa tēvs Aleksandrs, kāpēc viņa nav uz datums, tas nelaimīgais 37. gads, jo viņu arestē par it kā dalību fašistiskā garīdznieku organizācija, diezgan pazīstam, pazīstamas frāzes un apvainojumi, ja mēs sekojam līdz arī mūsdienu retorikai, Un, un viņu vienkārši nogalina cietumā, ģimenei nepasaka, kas, kas ar Aleksandru ir noticis, un viņš apglabāts brāļu kapos turpat cietumu pagalmā. Un, un Aleksiju arī arestē, mēģina viņam, viņam kaut kā pierādīt kaut kādu nepa, neparastu dīvainu vainu un, un apsūdz, ka viņš ir kontrolēra Un viņš nedrīkst strādāt par garīdznieku. 
Tas vēl ir viss pirms kāra, un kur parādās viņa nepaklausība, viņš iestājās studēt fizmatos, fizikas un matemātikas fakultātē, izmācās par fiziķi, viņš pat katedrā tur strādā un pēta kaut ko saistībā ar iežiem, neprasiet man, kas tas ir, es iežu var tikai apbrīnot, es nemāk viņu saprast tik labi. Bet paralēli viņš organizē tā saucamās katakombu baznīcu, tātad viņi nelegāli satiekās pie draudzes cilvēku mājās un tik un tā notura divu kalpojumus. Un tikai tad, kad Kieva okupē nacisti, viņš atkal kļūst par pilntiesīgu garīdznieku. Viņam tas ir tik svarīgi, ka viņš tur, cik es saprotu, maldās pāri, ne pāri fronts līnijām, bet pa to nacistu okupētām teritorijām, lai tikai varētu tikt līdz kādam, kas varētu viņu atkal iesvētīt kā rīznieku kārtā. Nu, tāds ļoti nepaklausīgs, līdzīgi kā žānis, jau pirms kāra gatavojas tam, ka kaut kādām lietām var arī neklausīt dažādiem uz lodēļu, viņam cēliem uz lodēļu, žanim tas bija varbūt izdzīvošanas jau uz lodēļu, jo viņš bija kontrabandists. Nu, lūk, un 41. gadā viņam, protams, diezgan ātri top skaidrs, ka, ja viņa neko nedarīs, tad cilvēki ies bojā. Un šeit atkal atcerieties balsu, tev nebūs melot, Taču Aleksijs patiešām izsniedz nu melīgas apliecinājums, ka šie konkrētie cilvēki ir kristieši, kristīti un interesanti arī, ka viņš nespiešam, nelaimē nokļūšam ebrejam patiešām tā kā adot šo savu ticību, ja šis cilvēks bija ticīgs un pievērsties kristietībai. Ir gadījumi arī Latvijā, kur, jā, ebrei slēp, taču viņam arī ar varu bez maz liek piedalīties divkalpojumā un pielūgt dievu tā, kā to dara kristieši. Šeit Glagoļevs tomēr saprot, ka tas ir sirdsapziņas jautājums, bet šobrīd ir svarīgi glābt cilvēku dzīvības. Viņam izdodās izglābt vairākus cilvēkus. Diemžēl Germājas ģimene ar visu to, ka Glagoļev ģimene ļoļo centās viņas glābt, un teķiem pat bija katāvā liecināta, ka tur noteikti viņa nav ebreja, diemžēl viņam neizdodās izglābt. Bet to risku var arī Izabēles Mirkiņas ģimene stāstā vairs saklausīt, Kādu milzīgu risku uzņēmās arī Aleksēja Sīva, jo viņa Izabēle izglābi adodot viņai savu pasi. Glagoļev ģimenei kaut kādā brīdī ir bijis ugunsgrēks, pasi nedaudz apdegusi, pēc tam dzēšot ugunsgrēku izmirku sūdenī, un tur tie zīmogi ir pietiekami paplūduši, kļūši tik neskaidri, ka izdodās ielīmēt Izabēles fotogrāfiju un paslēpt viņu laukos jau kā ukrainieti glagoļievu. Nu, lūk, šādi stāsti. Man, protams, ļoti patīk tas nepaklausības elements. Un es gribu ātri, ātri vēl vienu stāstu ar jums dalīties, vēl vienā stāstā. Noteikti, ja esat redzējuši, esat ceļojuši vai esat ļoti bijuši, ļoti vērīgi gājēji Rīgā, tad esat papanījuši šādas piemiņas zīmes. Pārrasti mēs to saistām ar holokaustā nogalinātiem cilvēkiem, ar holokaustu saprotot tieši pret ebrejiem vērstu naidu. Taču oriģinālā ideja bija, ka ja cilvēku ir skārušas nacistu represijas, un viņš ir gājis bojā, un tie nebija tikai ebreji, bija arī romi, kurus deportē uzreiz uz nāvas nomirnēm, ir bijuši homoseksuāli cilvēki, kurus vajāja un arī nogalināja. Un jeb kurš stāsts patiesībā, ja jūsu ģimenes locekls vai šo cilvēku ģimenes locekļu ir cietuši no represijām, tad drīkst pieprasīt, ka pieteikties, lai par godu šim cilvēkam tiek iestrādāts akmens. Es latviski 
skan klubšanas akmens, tas varbūt skan kaut kā negatīvi, ka jūs klūpjot un tad varat sasisties un tā tālāk, bet tā ideja ir, ka, ka jūs paklūpat ne, un atceraties, ja, un kamēr vien ir dzīves cilvēku vārds, kamēr jūs viņu atceraties, tikmēr, nu, nosacīt arī šī atmiņa par cilvēku ir dzīva. Noteikums ir, ka vienam upurim drīkst būt viens akmens, un, piemēram, mājaslapā var arī atrast tāds ziņas, ka viens, viena akmenis iestrādāšana izmaksās jau 120 eiro. Varbūt ārpus Vācijas tas ir mazliet dārgāk, bet nu ir. Un Rīgā es mielikusi fotogrāfiju no Rīgas, bet šādi akmeņi ir arī Ukrainā. Un par vienu akmeni es šodien gribētu jums pastāstīt, jo man arī šis stāsts likās tāds ļoti vērtīgs, ko mēs varam no tā uzzināt. Es gribu jūs iepazīstināt ar Cēzaru Kacu, kuru, kuru es dzīvi patiesībā nodzīvo ar vārdu Vasils Mihailovskis. Un... Un tā arī ir viena tā, tā lieta, ko es arī Latvijā esmu saskārusies ar šādiem stāstiem, ka šīm ebreju bērniņām tālāk dzīvē tiek iedos cits vārds. Un, un tad tā ir tāda arī interesanta identitātes jautājums, ka, kurš, kas tad viņš ir Cēzars vai, vai Vasilis. Laikam sanāka divi vienā. Viņš pats savas atmiņas nu, nosaucis, ka viņam savās atmiņās pieminējis, ka viņam ir bijuši četras mammas un divi tēti un viens liktenis. Tāda, tāda interesanta, interesants veids, kā pieteikt savu izglābšanās stāstu. Un Cezars piedzīmā ebrei ģimenē. Viņam Dimžēl mamma bija gājusi bojā, nomirusi mēnesi pēc tam, ka viņš piedzima. Ģimenē bija brālis, pavļiks, tā viņš viņa atcerās, tētis, vecmāmiņa un auklīte Nāsķa, Anastasija Fomina. Un tēti iesauca sarkanījā armijā, tātad nacistu ienākšanas brīdī viņš nav ar ģimene kopā. Un patiesībā katsu ģimenei izdodās nokļūt līdz vilcieniem, un viņi ir gatavi evakuēties. Taču pats Cezars atcerās, ka tobrīd prioritāti ir bijuši, bijuši fabrikas, izvēst, izvēst rūpniecību, un tāpēc tas vilciens ir iesprūdus uz nedēļu stacijā. Ir beigušies līdz paņem tie ēdieni, un vecmāmiņi ir teikusi nasķēji, aizēja uz mūsu dzīvokli un paņem vēl kaut ko, kas noderēs ceļā, ko mēs vēl varam izdzīvot. Un nezinu, kāpēc, bet nasķi izdomā paņemt līdz arī mazo Cēzaru, viņa aiziet, paņem lietas, atgriežās un, un vilcieni nav. Ģimene ir evakuējusies. Un tā viņa paliek ar mazo ebreju puiku par kuru jārūpējas. Pats Cezars, ja pas, ja viņš saka, ka viņi bijis ļoti, ļoti vienkārši cilvēki. Viņi varbūt nav bijis pat gudrākā sieviete tobrīd, tobrīdējā Kijevā, bet viņai ir bijis laba sirds. Un, diemžēl, kaimiņos dzīvojušais sētnieks ir ļoti labi zinājis, ka kāds ir ebreji un ka reku mazais Cezars ir, ir palicis. Un tad, kad avīzē publicē aicinājumu visiem ebrejiem pamest mājas un pulcēties kopā un, un paņemt vērtslietas, tad sētnieks arī ir tut, kā tut, klāt un, un dod padomu pēdiņās, ka arī to mazo puiku, jā, ebreju ir obligāti, obligāti jāizved prom. Un nasķa paklausa. Un... Un, diemžēl, tas, uz kurien tad tos ebrejas dzen, uz kurien viņas ved, nav kaut kāda evakuācija vai deportācija, bet nāvē babiņa jarā. Un mazais puika atcerās to dienu, es atļāvos izrakstīt viņa, viņa citātu. Tas, tas ir manā tūlku, vai mēs ļoti atvainojos, es neesmu filologs. Bija saulaina diena, zelta rudens un ļoti daudz ļaužu. Nodomāju, ka tā ir kāda demonstrācija, kā tās, kurās jau bija bijis ar tēti kopā. Pat palūdzu naģēju nopirkumam balonu un karodziņus, gāju balansējot pa tramvai sliedēm. 
tā balansēšana varbūt pat ir laba lieta, jo viņš paklūp, sasitās, pārsit seju, tā kā asinis, apkārt ir daudz ļaužu, un nasķē vienīgā gudrā lieta, viņa tur rokā savu ukrainieties pasi, kur rakstīts, ka viņa ir ukrainieti. Un, un visā tajā haosā viņa pamana, ka mazais ir sasities, asiņo, Un aiziet uz pumpu, nomazgāt viņam seju. Un pa to brīdi, kamēr viņi tur sakot to bērniņu, tas pūlis jau ir pavirzījies, un viņi, viņus nepamāna. Viņi aiziet prom. Divas nedēļas viņus labstās, viņi saprot, ka atgriezties ar ebrei bērnu viņi nedrīkst. Un tad atkal kāds labs cilvēks iedod padomu, nu, ko tu jūs abi divi neizdzīvosiet šādas labstoties, adod to cēzeru, adod to puiku bērnu namā. Un Nasti tā izdara. Vienīgais, ko viņi paspēja, um, varbūt, kas arī parāda to, ka viņa varbūt uh, bija mazliet naiva, viņa saka, ka šis puika ir gadiņu vecs, ka viņš ir dzimis 40. gadā. Un puikam uz to brīdi jau ir 3-4 gadiņi. Ja? Tā kā, nu, tas varbūt nebija pats gudrākais lēmums, bet viņa iedod puikam citu vārdu – vāsja un savu uzvārdu – homins. Tā uh, Cēzars nukļūst pie savas, tā saucamās ot, trešās mammas, nu jau pirmā dzimusi, es atvienu, mirusi īsi pēc dzemdībām, otrā bija auklīta nādzja, un tagad uh, bērnam vadītāji uh, ņina gudu kofu. Uh, tas patiesībā nav bērnams, tā ir bijusī bērnu slimnīca, kur atradušies slimi bērni, bet tad, kad sācies viss tas haos, vecāki ir, ir vai no ar varu vai paši kaut kā evakuējušies, un bērniem žēl palikuši slimnīcā. Slimnīca atrodas 70 bērnu, uz visu šo bāru, tātad ir Ņina Gudkova, viena medmāsiņa, ne, divas medmāsiņas, viena sanitāre, viens sētnieks un saimniecības daļas vadītājs. Tātad varat iedomāties, kas, kas tur notiek. Uh, un nav nekādas apgādes, vara, vara nekādīgi neatbalst šo, šo bērnu namu. Uh, Tātad uh, ļoti daudz bērnu saslimst ar slimībām, ir bērni, kas nomirst arī no bāda, jo tiešām apstākļi ir drausmīgi. Uh, un cik var saprast, tad... Uh, Nu, maz puisīšu gadījumā tas, laikam, ir elementāri, bet uh, ik pa laikam ir bijusi pārmeklēšana bērna namā šajā slimnīcā, un visi, kas ir bijuši ebrei, tika slēpti. Tā kopā esot 12 bērni izglābt šādā veidā. Uh, Ņina ir ļoti, ļoti rūp, kā tev viņa tos bērnus pabaros. Uh, viņa iet pie varas un runā un panāk atļauju, ka vecākie no bērniem ies uz restorānā virtuvi, tur, kur jau ir atkritumi nevis ēdienas, un no tiem atkritumiem un no ēdiena atliekā mēģinās kaut ko sakasīt, ko tad pēc tam var pārstrādāt daudz maz cienīgā ēdienā. Tādi bija apstākļi. Vēlāk par šo, par šo bedīgi slaveno bērnā muzina arī vietējo iedzīvotāju, bet nu, tā, tā ir pilsēta, jā, ēdiena ir kā ir. Un kaut kādi vīri atved melasu Tāds melns, lipīgs salc šķidrums, un mazais, nu, tajā brīdī jau jāsaka vāsja, atcerās, kā viņš tie bērni visi klupuši tām mucām virsū, un viņš ir paspējis, tagad viņš maziņš, iemērkt piedurkni līdz elkonim, un ta visu dienu laizīt un sūkāt un to piedurkni ņurkāt, līdz tiešām ir tāda sajūta, ka viņš ir visu, visu, visu apēdis. Nu, tādi... Tāda bija apstākļa. Tad arī šajos skribos apstākļos tomēr vasiem izdodās izdzīvot, un viņš sagaida kara beigas. Diemžēl tēts nepārnāk, un viņš, viņš ir apēļš bārens. Arī vecmā viņa ir brāli, uz to brīdi nav. Un, un viņš lēnā novēro, kā viens pa vienam, Vai nu atrodās kādu bērnu vecāku, kas ir izdzīvojuši, vai nu pāri, kuriem nav bērnu, izlēma adoptēt kādu no šī bērnam. Un beigās sanāk, ka viņš gandrīz vienīgais ir palicis. Un viņš tad sāk tās to medmāsiņu tirdīt, kad, kad nāks man pakaļ, kad nāks man pakaļ. Un medmāsiņa kaut kā nepadomājas, iesaucās rīt pagaida. Nu, tā kā viņa grib, lai, lai, viņš, lai viņš liek viņu mierā. 
Un nākamajā dienā bērnamā tiešām ierodās pāris, kas ir gatavi adoptēt. Uz to brīdi viņi gan ir gatavi adoptēt meitenīti, nevis puiku. Uh, bet mazais Vasja novaktē, uh, ka, ka, ka ir ieradušies vecāki, ka viņam ir iespēja. Un viņš ielaužās direktors kabinetā, jā, bez atļaujas ienāk, pieskrien klāt uh, abiem pieaugušajiem, apķer viņas un kliedz papaču kā mamaču, ka tā, jā, vaš sin zibirīci viņā. Tā, mami, tētī, es esmu jūsu dēls, savāciet man, paņemiet man. Un, un šī, šis atgadījums, nu tā ir iespaidojis šos, šos potenciālos vecākus un arī sakrita, ka, ka tētis šis otrais tētis, ja, ja mēs turpinām to viņa apgalvojumu, ka viņam bija divi, nobrīnās redzēt kāds liktens, tu esi vāsja, es esmu vāsja, nu tad dzīvosim arī kā ģimene. Ko viņš uz to brīdi nezin, ka viņa ceturtā mamma Berta arī rebrīte. Un viņa šis tētis, pēckara tētis Vasīlijs arī vēlāk tiek atzīts par taisno starp tautām Izrēlā, jo viņš to savu ebreju izcelsmu sievu, kas bija medmāsiņa, viņš ir ārsts, viņa medmāsiņa tāda dienas ramāna sanāk, viņš viņu paglāki. Viņi slēpšies dažādās vietās, kaut kur ir kāds sazīmējs, ka, viņi, ka, viņi, ka, ka Berta ir ebrejiete. Un tā viņi ir slapstījušies un beidzot laimīgi izdzīvojuši. Skaisti stāsts ir, ka tad, kad Vasīlijs izsaka bildinājumu Bertai, Berts mamma galīgi nav sajūsmā par šo neebreja znotu. Un tad znots ir savu nākamo sievsmātu nošarmējis, jo viņš ir iemācījies jidišu. Pietiekam, lai varētu šarmēt kundzi. Uh, un ir viena lieta, ko noteikti Marta arī tam pieskarsies šim jautājumam. Šo visu stāstu, kā izglābjās Berta, cik drosmīgs bija viņas vīrs, patiesī par lielām mokām pats Vasja arī mammai izprasa. Tie ir bijuši jau 90. kādi, ir ieradies, ir tāds Shoah Foundation, Amerikā bāzēts, kur 90. gados apbraukā arī Latvija taiskaitā un ierakstīja Holokostā izdzīvojušo atmiņas, arī glābēja atmiņas tādējais. Un uh, uz to brīdi Bertai jau ir bijis um, insults uh, un viņa bijis ļoti, ļoti slīma, varētu teikt, un Vāsja ir sēdējis. Un vilcis pa teikumam laukā Bertas izdzīvošanas stāstu. Nu, tā neviens vēsturnieks neuzdrošināt, uz man gribētos ticēt vākt ziņas, jo tas ir ļoti, ļoti saldzīgs process, cilvēks, cilvēks stāstot patiesībā pārdzīvo otro reizi to savu traumu, vai trešo reizi, vai ceturto reizi, daži, daži atsaliecinieki ir vismaz jau tik bieži stāstījuši, ka, ka, ka viņiem jau tāds gatavs prāzes, un zin kā, ar kuru brīdi viņi sāks, ar kuru beigs, bet nu tā, ka, ka cilvēkam jau ir ļoti, ļoti slikti, un, un, un kāds viņi pateikumam mocīt, un ar knīpstangām vilkt laukā, tā es ceru, mēs nederam. Nu, tāds tāds īsi ieskats, šī iestāsti uzrunāja mani, jo es meklēju tos cilvēku stāstus, manuprāt, kāda skaitļi vien nespēs radīt tādu empātisko saikni ar, ar, ar tā laikam ar cilvēkiem, bet, manuprāt, tieši empātija arī slēpjas tas noslēpums, um, Kāpēc, kāpēc mēs saprotam tos cilvēkus, kāpēc mēs līdzi jūtam šiem cilvēkiem un saprast, ebreis vai neebreis, šie cilvēki bija cilvēki pirmām kārtām un, un netaisni vajāti, netaisni mocīti. Un, un pats šausmīgākais noziedznieks visdrīzāk nebūtu tomēr pelnīja šādu liktenu, ka ar visu ģimeni viņu, viņu nošauja bedrē vai, vai noindē gāzes kamerā. Tā kā empātija noteikti ir būtiska sastāvdaļa, un es gribētu jūs aicināt, šie gan bija stāsti par Ukrainu, bet 
bet, bet mūsu pašu nogalinātos cilvēkus es gribētu, lai mēs pieminam 30. novembrī. Es ceru jūs satikt pie brīvības pieminekļā, dedzinot svecītes, cenšoties noturēt simboliski, noturēt šīs gaismiņas spožas. Manuprāt, tas simbolizē arī to, ka mēs atmiņu par šiem cilvēkiem turam spožu, un mums nav tik daudz tiek lupšanas akmeņi, atcieši Tolperštaina, bet tad mēs vismaz varam noturēt šīs gaismiņas dzīves. Tā kā tiekamies 30. novembrī piebrīvīs pīmenekļi, un ja netiekli drīgai, tad iedzniet svecīti kaut vai savā mājā pie loga. Paldies par uzmanību. Paldies. Jā, atcerīt. Sveiki atpakaļ. Es izlasīju, ka mums bija visi tās tehniskās grūtības pašā sākumā. Jums bija pietrūka gani austiņu. Tāpēc es vēlreiz vienkārši gribētu jums pastāstīt, kas ir vēsturniece un pētniece Marta Havriško. Pēc tam arī dosim vārdu viņai. Mārta ir jau ilgadējis veikus pētījums Holkausta laukā gan par Ukrainu, gan Austrum Eiropā. Viņa ir milzīga pieredze darbā ar intervijām un vācot materiāls par izdzīvojušiem un viņu ģimenēm un ebrēju glābējiem Ukrainā. Viņas tēmu loks ir arī tādas pavisam nevieglas tēmas, kas ir arī vardarbība pret sievietēm, feminisms un nacionālisms un vardarbība otrā pasaules kara laikā. Mēs tam viņas pētījumiem tā arī saucās dzimums un holokausta seksāla vardarbība pret ebreju sievietēm nacista okupētajā Ukrainā, kas skan mazliet atgādinot ziņu virsrakstu šobrīd, kad Krievi ir okupējusi un karo nežēlīgi Ukrainā. Tāpēc es domāju, ka es ļoti ceru, ka mums varbūt būs vēl kāda iespēja Marta uzaicināt uz lekcijām, kas fokusētos uz to. Šodien mūsu tēma ir par ebrēju glābējiem Ukrainā, kur viņa ir milzīga pieredze, jo viņa arī vāda Babiņars Stardisciplināro pētījuma institūtu, kas ir Babiņars Holkausta memoriālā. Mēs ielikām Facebookā, cik daudz grāmatu un pētījuma autore viņa ir. Ok, Marta, that was a long introduction. Second time, because we're going to cut off the beginning of the video since we had technical difficulties. So just to have some introduction to who you are and how honored we are to, to have you here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Marta holds a um, uh, holds PhD uh, degree in history. Uh, from Lviv, from uh, Ivana Frankivsk National University, and she's a uh, Babinian Interdisciplinary Studies Institute Director at Babinian Holocaust Memorial Center. She's done about a lot of research about the history of women's history, feminism, and nationalism, and uh, uh, one of the latest uh, research she has done is a gender in the Holocaust, sexual violence against Jewish women in Nazi-occupied Ukraine. Today, we would uh, want your expertise and uh, sharing um, uh, your um, approach, uh, interviewing, uh, getting material about the rescuers and rescued in Ukraine. And uh, so we're very happy you are here. And um, yeah, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear Lolita. And um, thank you. Uh, um, to all of you who joined our conversation today, I am very happy and pleased to be here. And also, I am very, I feel very privileged to be among you today, because, as you know, many Ukraine scholars can't proceed with their study nowadays due to due to the war. Actually, some of, some of them actually took their arms and went to the front line. Some of them are involved in volunteering work. Some of them just can't do their work actually because uh, of their problems with electricity caused 
by Russian massive missile attacks on Ukraine in the past, past months. So I really feel very privileged to be with you and share with you uh, my research. And um, uh, I will today concentrate on the situation in Ukraine with the Holocaust survivors themselves and um, their family members, situation with the righteous among the nation in Ukraine, how actually they react to this Russian aggression and what we as a society, as a human beings can do in this situation. So let me share my screen. I prepare some um, some visuals in order to make it more uh, more clear, uh, more clear my points. So the title of my presentation reads, why is this happening? Holocaust survivors and their rescuers during Russia's war on Ukraine. This quote, why is this happening? This is the most frequent question nowadays in Ukraine. Why the war is happening? Why we are witnessing such great amount of of brutality, of aggressiveness, such amount of um, human rights violation. Why we are living in this world of never again ethic? Why we failed actually to prevent these horrors? And why those who witness and experience the World War II and the Holocaust now face another threats, existential threats from Russia? As maybe all of you know, the first wave actually of justification of Russian aggression in Ukraine started before even the 24th February with the Holocaust distortion, with the distortion of the World War II, with the blaming that uh, Ukraine's only in collaboration with Nazis omitting all the complicity, all their, uh, all their complexity of the World War II. And um, Putin, in his angry address, television address, on the eve, actually, of the start of this full-scale invasion, he mentioned, to, the, to this end, we will seek to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine blaming that authority in Ukraine are like Nazis and people who support Ukraine authorities are Nazis or fascists. This was one of the main justification, ideological justific justification of this brutal aggression. But what Russian soldiers are doing now, they actually destroying the Holocaust memory in Ukraine. They are targeting memorial places in Ukraine, like Baban Yar Memorial Place, where, as you know, at the end of September, more than 33,000 Jews were killed. Many of them were women, children, and elderly. Altogether, we could speak about approximately 100,000 victims of Baban Yar. And nowadays, we have five more victims who were killed as a result of Russian missile attack on the first March of this year. On this day in the evening and at 5 p.m., a Russian missile hit the capital's main radio and TV tower. The second explosion was after that, and the building that was heat actually. It was the avant-garde sport complex that was under renovation by the Babanyar Holocaust Memorial Center. And here in the photo, you can see the damage, the level of damage. In this building, we plan to open the museum of the Holocaust in Ukraine and the Eastern Europe. Not only Babanyar Memorial Center, not only Babanyar Memorial place actually face the consequences of Russian genocide on Ukraine and Russian brutality. Also, Drobetsky Yar, 
this monument dedicated to 15,000 of Jewish people who were killed in Drobitsky Yar in the outskirts of Kharkiv city in the eastern part of Ukraine, nowadays looks like that. It was, it was shelled on the 26th March this year. But not only memorial sites are targets, actually, for Russian missiles and for Russian bombs and rockets. Here you see the consequences of Russian shelling in Bila Tserkva, in Starokiv Jewish Cemetery, shelled at the beginning of March this year. And this is also cause a great damage to the history and memory of Jewish community in Ukraine. Another damage was did to uh, another Jewish museum in Hluhiv, in Sume Oblast, in May this year. And you could see by your own eyes the consequences of this attack. Many synagogues in Ukraine now are damaged or destroyed completely, like some synagogues in Mariupol. We can't have access to the information what is going on nowadays in the Russian occupied territories in Ukraine, temporarily Russian occupied territories. But taking into consideration Russians' brutality in other localities, we can assume that different cultural objects, memorial sites, are also suffering from this brutal war. But not only material objects are suffering. First of all, Putin and his inner circles and, and his soldiers are trying to destroy living memory about the Holocaust in Ukraine. I mean, first of all, the Holocaust survivors who are still living in Ukraine and face the all horrors of the war. Vanda Obietkova from Mariupol was 91 years old when the Russian army attacked Mariupol. Mama didn't deserve such a death, her daughter Larissa claimed. Mama loved Mariupol. She never wanted to leave, she said. Vanda was 10 years old in 1941 when the Germans occupied her native city. Her mother, and here you see um, on the left on the, this picture, was murdered like other Jews in the outskirts of Mariupol by Nazis and their local collaborators. Her father managed to hide Wanda in the hospital for the duration of the Nazi occupation. When the shelling and bombings began at the beginning of March this year, the family of Wanda moved into the basement of a neighboring heat and supply store. Every time a bomb fell, the entire building shook. Wanda kept asking, why is this happening? There was no water, no electricity, no heat. We were living like animals, her daughter said. Due to these harsh conditions, Wanda perished at the beginning of April this year in Mariupol basement. She was not buried even properly because of the constant Russian shelling. She was buried in a park in the Mariupol. Not only Wanda faced the consequences of Russian aggression. Here in this slide, you see the picture of Elvira Bors, 87-year-old Ukrainian woman who survived the Holocaust and Nazi siege of Leningrad. During the interview made by Vera Hirich, Vera Hirich is the Ukrainian journalist who made the interview with Elvira in Kyiv, where Elvira actually escaped with her husband, and it was her last, actually, interview because she was killed by Russian bombs on the April 28th in her apartment in Kyiv. Elvira and her 94-year-old husband spent the modern months under constant shelling during the siege of their city. Elvira recalled, that war, meaning World War II, deprived me of the possibility of having children. My entire life 
I try to forget. And now I am forced to recall. I'm terrified. For many Holocaust scholars, current war, current Russia aggression caused re-traumatization. They started to remember, to recall their experience, experience of their beloved ones, of their neighbors, Jewish neighbors during the Holocaust, of their family members who perished and who were silenced by death. On this picture, you see Natalia Brezhnaya. She is 88 years old and she is living in Odessa. Well, spoken to the member of Joint Distribution Committee, she said, I was a little girl when I had to go to the basement and hide from the bombings over Odessa in 1941. And I can't imagine going there again. Many Holocaust survivors were trying to, to seek a safe space in Ukraine. Many of them were provided with help from different Jewish organizations and our Babanyar Holocaust Memorial Center. On this photo, you see two Holocaust survivors, Ala Sinelnikova from Kharkiv and Sonia Tartakovska from Irpin. They were evacuated to the Germany. And Sinelnikova remember, I never thought I would live to see such horror for the second time in my life. I thought it was in my past, all over and done with. And now we are reliving it. But not only Holocaust survivors are suffering from this war. Those who helped their Jewish neighbors, despite of all odds, despite the risk caused by Nazi policy in Ukraine, also are in very precarious situation nowadays. I want to tell you about one of the brave Holocaust saver, actually, Alexander Slobodinuk. In the last decades, Alexander, 93 year, years old, had been living in a village on the banks of the Dnipro River in Kherson Oblast. During this summer, in July 2022, she, he perished far from his home. Before the World War II, Alexei uh, Slobodinuk and he, uh, Alexander Slobodinuk and his parents lived in one of the villages near Bershaj, the town in Vinnytsia region. Once in 1942, Alexei was walking not far from the camp. He noticed the boy, and his name was David um, Hershenhorn. The boy was of the same age approximately as the son of Alexei. The man spoke to him, but the boy could not understand nothing because he spoke only Romanian and Yiddish. Alexei, Alexei brought the boy to the best house, fed him in the restaurant kitchen when, where he was working, and then brought him to his own home. Alexei told his son, Sashko, that he had brought him a little brother and that they would now be living together. Alexei and his wife, Motrena, did everything possible to make this boy feel at home. And Sashko himself taught him Ukrainian language. The Slobodyanyuk's father and son secretly brought food to the camp for David's mother, Dora, and later helped her leave the camp dressed in the Ukraine peasant clothing. For a month, she lived secretly in their house, in their home. Then she was brought to their relatives in a distant village. In 1993, David succeeded in getting Yad Vashem to award the title of Righteous Among the Nation to Alexei, Motrena, and Alexander. And here you see their meeting in 1977 in Ukraine. And they, from this period of time, they were in, in close connection. They were in touch all the time. They were help each other. But uh, David was only uh, was the first actually who died after the sur surgery on his heart. 
Um, when the war started, Alexander and his family moved to Western Ukraine to their relatives. Then they get some support to rent the apartment in Lubny in Poltava Oblast. Alexander, Alexander son-in-law of Sashko Slobodyanyuk, remembered. Granddad is crying. He wants to go, to go home. But what home? There is only shooting there. The Russian soldiers are going from house to house and seizing cars. I hid mine. There was an explosion in a neighboring garage. Then shooting once again. I fell on top of my grandson and covered him. Fear and horror. I see houses and roofs flying into the sky from the explosions. In mid-June this year, Alexander Slobodinuk celebrated his 93rd birthday. After his celebration, he made an appeal to Jewish people and international organizations and foundations. In this appeal, he said, could I have ever thought that at the age of 93, I would be forced to leave a place dear to my heart, a house that I built with my own hands, my property, and travel hundreds of kilometers away from the artillery uh, bombardments of the Russian occupiers. I could not remain under occupation of the Russian army because they are destroying houses, cars, and people in their paths, not, pay, not pitting children, women, or old people. Did I think that in my life, I would have to see fascists in my home a second time? In 1993, I was awarded the title of the Righteous Among the Nations at Yad Vashem. During the Second World War, my parents and I saved the lives of Jews, risking their own lives. And at the present time, now that we have left our home, I am obliged to request for the help of the Jewish people to obtain living quarters. This appeal was very touching and many organizations were trying to help Alexander, but months later, he died. Another Holocaust, uh, uh, another um, uh, rescuers, another righteous among the nation ended up she left her uh, she left ukraine and ended up here in switzerland actually a month ago approximately i received a request from local media who made a great a big um, article about the lydia and her actually and her living condition here in lutzem in switzerland she was rescued with the support of israeli ambassador mikhail brodsky um, in on 11 April this year. And uh, here you see actually the pictures when Lydia and her family members started their journey. But the similar to the Holocaust, when the rescue actually was the consequences uh, of many, many people, in the case of Lydia was the same, not only Israeli am ambassador, Israeli embassies in different countries supported Lydia in his way to the new home, but also British aid worker Johnny Daniels and his charity from the depths. He provided a safe passage to the border with the Poland. Then it was actually, she was uh, held by Israeli embassy, uh, uh, to cross the border, and he then took uh, the family members of Lydia and herself to Lucerne. Lydia and her parents, Stepan and Nadia, and her brother Valentin lived in Vinnytsia during the war. They hid four members of the Manis family who were Jewish. In March 1942, they provided shelter to a Soviet soldier who had escaped a camp for prisoners of, for, uh, of war. The soldier, who knew no one in Vinnytsia, introduced himself as Ivan Petrov. Later, he told them that his name was Isaac Tartakovsky, and he came from Kyiv. And here you see actually the paintings of Isaac Tartakovsky during he uh, uh, made during the war and after the war. Uh, 
In April 1943, when the Sarchuk family was ordered to vacate their home for German soldiers, they moved to another suburb area with Tartakovsky, and they still keep him at their home. Tartakovsky lived openly, and he only way, uh, went into the hiding in the attic when people came to the house and check their identity papers. After the war, Isaac became a well-known painter. In 1951, uh, um, by accident, he met Lydia once again in Kyiv. They fell in love, and two years later, they got married and went uh, on to have two children, Anatoly and Olena. They had a wonderful marriage and remained together until Isaac's death at the age of 90 in 2002. Lydia and her parents were named righteous in 1995. On January, 2nd January, 1995, uh, uh, 1995, actually, they received this honorly medal and the certificate. Medal of Honor is one of the few things the Sarchuk family took from Ukraine, war torn Ukraine to Switzerland, along with their few clothes and all photos. Another rescuer who perished during this brutal war was Olena Malova Zavatska. She was 97 when she died. Olena was born in 1925 in Mohilipodilsk, also in Vinnyskova. Her father was a forester and her mother was a housewife. In 1937, her father, Yevhen, faced Soviet repressions. He was executed next year. And only dozens year later, family learned what happened to him. During the Nazi occupation, the family was helping Jews in the summer 1941. During the raids of German police, they were hiding the Jewish family of Lerner, who were their neighbors. But also, they provided shelter for Celia Perelman and her daughter, Sarah. Here you see the school picture where Sarah and Olena are standing together because they were close friends from their childhood. In autumn, Simon Perelman died on ty of typhus. Celia, with younger son Alexander, moved to the ghetto, but Sarah li lived with Zavatsky till the end of the occupation. In 1948, Olena finished studying in Odessa. She became a doctor. She was working in Donbass region. In 1987, family moved to Kyiv. Sarah Perelman also became a doctor. After the successful graduating from Leningrad Medical Institute, she was a children's cardiologist. In 1992, she immigrated to the United States of America. On September 19, uh, 29, 1996, Yad Vashem recognized the family of Zabatsky as a righteous among the nation. Here you see the picture of two girls together to close friends, to doctors, to, uh, to women who were close to, to the end of their lives. Olena died at the beginning of April this year. She was 97. Today, I want to talk also about another rescuer, Olympiada Saropolo or Dan Danelians. She was 99 this year, uh, actually, when she perished. Olympiada was born in Odessa during the Holocaust. Olympiada lived with her father, her Orhi, and her grandmother. Her mother died when she was 10 years old. In 1941, Orhi brought to their home a Jewish family with a newborn baby. There were Mikhail, Amalia, and Vicky Kvitko. And uh, actually, our uh, heroine is recalling, we lived as one family when they needed some, something. Mikhailo changed his clothes, put on a hat and looked like a Romanian. 
his wife, Mura sang well. I took a gramophone from my neighbor and we listened to records to divert, to divert attention from Wicca, who was crying. Germans were running around the city. Romanians were looking for Jews. When they came to our apartment and heard music, my father was, would come out and ask, what do you need? I took the little girl Wicca in my arms and said that she was my daughter. They saw the dad was disabled and they left. Olympiada recalls. Olympiada became one of the first Ukraine righteous among the nations, actually, recognized by Yad Vashem in 1993. She passed away uh, at, the, at the end of September this year. Uh, she was the last, actually, even the righteous among the nations in Odessa. Her grandson, Yevhen, now is a soldier in the Ukrainian army, and he is half Jewish. Another, our hero, who is still alive, is Nina Bogorat, or Sobutenko. She is 97 years old. In April 1942, a young Ukrainian soldier, Ivan Hristyuk, who had fled the Germans twice, came to Nina's home in the village of Lebedinsky in Zhitomar Oblast. His situation worsened and she wanted to take him to the underground doctors, but he refused. He explained that in addition to being in the underground, he was also a Jew and could be given up by anyone. He admitted that his name was actually Yakiv Bogorad and he was a Jew born in Kyiv. Bogorad soon became the head of the partisan sabotage unit that included more than 40 people, and Nina joined this unit as well. After the war, they both got married. She was an economist and he was a journalist. In 1998, Yad Vashem recognized Feodosia, Maria, and Nina as a righteous among the nations. Ivan passed away in 1984. Nina still lives in Kyiv with her family. And I hope that she is okay despite the all odds caused by Russian aggression. Olha Sikorenko, she is 96 year old. And um, Olha is recognized as a righteous of Baban Yar. She helped to rescue a Jewish girl whose relatives were killed in Baban Yar. She, this girl, Svetlana, was only four years old during a uh, massacre in Baban Yar. In March 2022, Russian soldiers occupied their house in Kozarovichi village in Kyiv Oblast. Later, they killed Olha's son-in-law when he was trying to evacuate the entire family. And her daughter at that accident uh, during this actually crime, she was wounded. Babanyar Holocaust Memorial Center helped them to evacuate to the safe place in Western Ukraine. But Olha, together with her daughter Tatyana, uh, they are dreaming of coming back to their native village and organize a proper burial to Vasily. We have no right to be silent, otherwise we are complicit in this murder. These words I heard from Elvira Bors during the interview that she gave after escaping of Mariupol. Those stories of those brave women and men who survived the Holocaust, who, su who survived the mass murders, who survived atrocities, those brave women and men who put their lives at risk, who put at risk the lives of their family members. A clear example that even in the circumstances of limited agency, we could make a right choice. We could choose the bright side. Those stories give us a hope. And I believe in these circumstances, the hope is very important. Thank you so much for your attention.
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this amazing lecture. Uh, so I'll be that person probably asking questions and maybe Maya too. Uh, so we are following the live chat, but uh, probably most people will listen to this lecture anyway later since Friday night. Uh, but um, so we are um, now living uh, through the time when there's a there's a war and the Russian occupation and uh, uh, violence um, in um, in Russia. So you have a lot of experience interviewing uh, people who have been uh, who lived through very traumatizing uh, stories. You know, Holocaust survivors, mm -hmm. rescuers. So what uh, what approach? would be similar actually interviewing people who have survived uh, who are Holocaust survivors and those who are now traumatized uh, by war because we know that uh, you know how journalists do the job they need the brightest story the amazing details and this is how they go it and I think that usually historians you know you're trying not to re-traumatize people but what what is your approach when you interview these uh, survivors and those who relatives are those who you know uh, who've been uh, killed mm -hmm. thank you so much for this very important question from my experience i know that the main principle uh, during this uh, conversation should be not harm so we we should take care about the emo emotional um, uh, emo emo emotional stance of our respondents of our speakers and it's very important to make them uh, feel safe uh, that's why very often uh, I, uh, I use this method i came to their own homes that they really feel safe i I am not in rush because it's very important to sacrifice your time to these people, not to interrupt them as much as you, you can. Listen to their stories. Also, those stories which are not directly co connected to, to the World War II, for example, or their war experience. Sometimes they want to share with you stories of their personal lives, of their everyday life today. And you should find this time to listen to these stories as well, because you must show respect to those people and their lived experience. Uh, but also very important in this regard, in this regard, not to uh, re-traumatize uh, re uh, re those people. That's why you should um, pay attention actually to their even bodily uh, body language, even to their facial expressions, you know, and if you witness, is if you see that people are really very upset, it's very hard to talk uh, about their experience, it's better to make some pause, it's better to change some subject to something positive. And always, always you should end your interview, your conversation with something good about their achievements, about their plans for the future, about the things that uh, they love to do, about their beloved ones, about something that gives them hope for the future, something that they uh, make them happy. It's very important. But also in this regard, um, very important to not to harm yourself. Uh, in many situations I witness, and we discuss this um, question with my colleagues, it's very important to develop caring strategies as well for yourself. Sometimes I felt really overwhelmed by, by those stories of horrors, of, of you know, deaths, of... Um, I was really, really upset. I was terrified sometimes. And sometimes you express this, this lack of, of hope even after, you know, dozens of those stories of betrayal, of, of human cruelty, especially from, from neighbors, you know. And um, it's very important actually to proceed with your own trauma that you experience while, while dealing with these traumatic stories, traumatic memories. And today I witness um, how many actually brave scholars are trying to record interviews of those people who 
uh, um, who actually faced the war for the second life, for the second time in, in their life. And I believe it's very important because we see that those people are passing away and they are very valuable experience. Um, it's very important to fix actually uh, their, um, their reflections on this war. And to, to show, and I believe in many cases, for example, when I'm dealing, when I'm talking to survivors of the sexual violence in war, I'm trying to give them, uh, those women, um, the example of those brave Holocaust survivors who survived different kinds of sexual violence during the Holocaust. This, uh, um, and, uh, uh, you know, and they, uh, they found this this strength even to speak up about the experience, to seek justice, to go to the Soviet trials and to put their perpetrators on trial. I I I'm working with the Soviet um, war crimes materials, and I really admire those women who were the voices not only for themselves. And they became the voices of those women who were silenced by death, who were perished in the Holocaust. They told about their experience, and sometimes even Soviet investigators and Soviet judges uh, charged with the sexual violence of those women, actually, who were perished. So some sort of justice was brought to the Jewish community because of the bravery of those Holocaust survivors who were not silent, who were very vocal about this strategy. And many of those women, it took, uh, to some women, it took maybe dozens of years, you know, and then they found the strength actually and started to talk about uh, this trauma. And I believe that those brave women could encourage and inspire uh, women in Ukraine nowadays, many of them uh, uh, who actually uh, face different horrors of war, including gender based violence. Here, one second, I'll ask my colleague Maya. Maya, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. okay. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess I have, first of all, comment uh, that um, uh, I'm almost 40. Uh, and uh, I know that my generation is also full of uh, trauma from the stories of grandmothers, for example, and grandfathers. And, and that's why this war also hits very close to home. As it said, like when we read the news, uh, some families can say, I know these stories It happened to, to my family members too. So it's, it's, there's something, um, there's something in it uh, that uh, even the most horrible part is, of course, for those people who survived the World War II and now have to deal with all this and uh, sometimes die in the, in the basements. They have to hide again. In the, it's just horrible. And uh, I know that some people would say, I have heard it about Holocaust. They would say, I can't go to like your museum. Even my friends would say, I can't face these stories. I just, I can't, I choose not to think about that and, and live on with my life. And I have heard also from this war that some people would say, I switch off the news, I can't bear it, it's too horrible. And uh, I just, uh, I, I, I live in this, I don't know, fake positive world maybe, or at mm -hmm. least I wouldn't like to judge these people. I understand the pain, of course. And I know that we are wired differently. And I know that these stories can also break uh, psyche and, and you can't do anything. Like I understand this, but I would like to hear your story because you have such an amazing career. And I also receive this question very often how you deal yourself with the, all these stories, with all this pain, what's your process to, to still be able to breathe and, and to do your everyday job and, and to, I hope, at least I, I'm working on that to, to keep uh, believing in the humanity 
and uh, have this childish, maybe naive dream that that the light will win the darkness and the good will win. And by good, I, of course, Slava Ukraine <laughs> <laughs> right now, of course. <laughs> and well, give us the, the backstory of all these processes that you have inside your psyche, inside your soul. Thank you so much, Maya, for this very important question. I want to stress that some research actually done by um, a psychologist said that uh, um, third generation actually experienced even uh, bigger trauma than, than second generation. And I believe in Ukraine, in the um, in former in the countries which belong to to former Soviet Union, is um, especially uh, um, it's especially why? Because third generation have better knowledge, actually. Because during Soviet time, many uh, Holocaust survivors, many rescuers even, were reluctant to talk about their experience because of the state anti-Semitism, because of the different, different reasons. They, you know, because of this policy, uh, of memory politics of covering the Holocaust, you know, and uh, and um, talking about the, the World War II under this umbrella, Soviet, you know, peaceful citizens and so on and so on. So there were many, many layers of silence. That's why people in their, even inside their families were not talking about this. That's why some studies are telling that, you know, uh, sad generation nowadays, it, it's even more traumatized by family histories, but by what they learn actually about the experience of their grandmothers, grandfathers, and so on. And um, I, uh, in my life, uh, I am digging the topic of the Holocaust and the World War II uh, almost 10 years. And, um, you know, I, I was in different phase, actually, of, of this research. At the beginning, actually, I can't, I really struggled with many testimonies. When I gave birth to my son, I, I can't just bear in mind all those stories, ho horrific stories about the killing of children, how people refuse sometimes to, to, to hide them, or about, you know, uh, uh, Germans and, and, you know, brutal, for example, policemen uh, in killing sites who were not willing to, to uh, give them a chance even to, to escape. Even, uh, you know, if they had this chance, you know, even if they had this possibility, you know, that's why I was really, I was really shocked. And I was trying to, to actually to deal with my own trauma. And I developed my own survival strategies, let's say, how to deal with this topic, because I understand that we should deal with these horrors, because we should learn from those uh, stories. We should um, educate uh, young generation. We should provide the content that uh, we should do, actually train our citizens to recognize the hate speech, to recognize the fair, first actually signs of probable you know, aggression and, and violence, especially ethnic violence. That's why I believe it's our responsibility as Holocaust scholars and Holocaust educators. That's why we should keep, uh, keep researching, keep developing different educational program, programs. But in order to do this, we should develop our own um, survival strategies. First of all, it's very important to to obtain this peer support to to form these groups of support informal groups of support and share our reflections share our uh, experience share our knowledge it was our strategy i remember during our field work uh, we conducted oral history in different localities where Jewish community was very present before the World War II. Uh, and we, uh, we were three or four scholars. And every day during this field work, actually, every day in the evening, we were sitting together and we're talking about our day, about what we witnessed, what we experienced. And we were trying actually 
to calm each other. You know, it was very important peer support. So first of all, peer support. The second one, I believe it's very important to to write down maybe your own uh, your own thoughts, your own you know fears that you can express easily to to other persons. For example, sometimes I feel really uh, even angry. For example, when some people are trying to justify some war crimes, crimes against humanity, they are trying you know to use some you know excuses, and it's make me really angry. When I hear the stories from my respondents who justify gender-based violence, for example, or make some sexist jokes, you know, I really, I, I am really very angry. And after the interview, I am trying to write down my thoughts. I am trying to understand why it, it irritates me and how I should control myself during the interview to make this interview more successful, let's say, and not to harm my respondent, you know. Uh, I also use audio recorder sometime and just, you know, I'm just... Uh, um, um, record my, my thoughts and then I'm listen to them in order to make this material as a training material for me because I'm trying to analyze this and and to be more prepared to different situation that could um, uh, come up during the interviews. But also I believe in our in our daily life work in our institutions we should, uh, have this access to institutional help. It could be some instructions, for example, how to protect your yourself, uh, um, not to bring all this pain and trauma to your family members, for example, because after the interview, we are coming uh, home to our uh, to our you know parents, to our kids. And sometimes uh, I, I understood that I'm not able even to play with my son. Because of this, I was really overwhelmed. So I believe institutional support is very important. And nowadays, um, actually, I understood that many of my colleagues, when they are trying to develop some research projects, um, they indicate that they indicate that they should have psychologists to involve. Uh, psychology, uh, psychologists, we, we, uh, which is trained actually to deal with trauma. So we as people who are dealing with trauma in our daily life work need this professional support, this supervision in, in order to not, not to burn out and in order not to be traumatized, you know. That's why I believe uh, this institu institutional support is very important. From, For example, it could be from our more, more experienced colleagues, uh, from our, you know, leadership in our institutions. And I believe while we are dealing with this difficult past, with these difficult, difficult topics, we should take care about our staff and uh, about our uh, about our peers because it's very very important our work is very important that's why let's support each other and let uh, continue our important work thank you so much yeah thank you so much for this uh, talk it was very much needed we learned uh, a lot about these unknown uh, Jewish uh, rescue stories in Ukraine and there are probably more and more that you can tell but the most tragic obviously was to see what is the fate now under the yes. uh, you know Russian occupiers what's the fate of these um, rescuers and rescues that you know they, they're dying before their time and they're suffering they're seeing it all over again uh, that's um, yeah that's horrible um, so thank you very much for for your talk. I really hope we can invite you again, and uh, because we don't have that much uh, here, lectures dealing with uh, traumatized uh, and with violence against women during the Second World War, and you're probably um, working now on research and and advising people um, how to how to deal it with now when you're interviewing people so yeah. my question is what you're working on now and um, 
and then one day I ho we hope to see you in Riga. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Lolita. So um, when the full scale invasion started, Russian invasion of Ukraine started, actually at the, during this night, I can't uh, go sleep and I was preparing my presentation about um, never again ethic for Holocaust educators pre um, organized by Yad Vashem actually. And uh, in all uh, my uh, in all my talks, I'm trying to include this gender perspective, because for the case uh, Jewish women, there are gendered sufferings were no uh, were unacknowledged, and due to you know due to different layers of silence, we we couldn't even imagine the level of sexual violence that they suffered in hands of. Germans, despite of racial laws and so on and so on. And uh, I was really shocked when I started to, to deal with Ukrainian cases. I was really shocked uh, how many local perpetrators, Nazi helpers, actually turned into violent sex offenders during the Holocaust. That's why I'm trying to bring to light those stories. Because uh, for me, it's like a warning signs for for uh, our community. Even today, we know that many sex offenders are very well known to their victims even before the uh, sex attack. And uh, for me, it's very important to to understand what makes those people to be so violent against their neighbors, against their classmates. That's why I'm trying to, to concentrate on my book about the uh, sexual violence during the Holocaust through the prism of Ukraine. But I should actually, I should admit, to be honest, because of the war, I actually distract a little bit my attention. So today I am trying also to make these parallels with the current Russian invasion and the generous suffering of men and women uh, in hands of Russian military. You know, when I hear the story about 11 years old boy in Ukraine who was raped in front of her, uh, her mother by Russian soldiers, I immediately recall the story of Jewish girls in Ternopil um, in July 1941 who were raped actually in front of their family members. And this public pattern of rape is very common during the Holocaust and during the genocides and ethnic violence and in many wars. Those perpetrators, they demand presence of audience. They enjoy their power and they demand this audience in order to inflict as much harm as possible, not only to the immediate survivors and their victims, but also to their beloved ones and the community members in general. And I was shocked how many parallels uh, about patterns of violence, about consequences of violence we can witness nowadays in this war. And when I'm talking about consequences, you know, I, I listen to dozens of uh, survivors, um, Holocaust survivors from Ukraine. I know that many of those rape survivors, Jewish rape survivors, experienced um, uh, experience nightmares, experience that we, uh, um, that things that we call nowadays PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, their sexual trauma had a tremendous effect on their marriage, on their social life, on their sexual life. And it, uh, you know, uh, sometimes men can't actually bury this and they left their women when they learned that they were raped. And we witness nowadays how many Ukrainian women are afraid to speak about this because they're afraid of reaction of, of their beloved ones, of their husbands, of their lovers, of their community members. So decades after the Holocaust, we still face the same problems, very similar problems.
but nowadays we are more um, aware about you know this this sexual trauma and the causes of this sexual trauma but many jewish women suffered in silence for decades and it should be the main actual lesson for us. And nowadays, when I am talking about the sex crimes committed by Russian military in this war, I am always making reference to those Jewish women and girls, mainly Jewish women and, and girls, but also some Jewish men and boys who were violated sexually during the Holocaust. And actually, I, I'm trying to, to extract these lessons and show that what we uh, should do nowadays to, to develop this survivor-centered approach, to overcome silence, to develop this holistic support, which uh, will, uh, will include um, medical, psychological, financial, social support to the survivors, their family members, because they are also survivors of the sexual, sexual violence, and the community in general. It's very, very important. That's why I'm, you know, trying to, to develop my research in different directions, because I believe that my study of the Holocaust give me some level of expertise to, you know, to make some, you know, estimations and judgments of what we're witnessing now and how we can help actually those survivors and how we can overcome uh, the stigma and silence around the war-related sexual violence as well as the sexual violence in peacetime. Okay, I'll ask one more. Um... Uh, probably a difficult question, but you know, we have in these rescue stories, there's always these stories we try to, not we try to, people try to hide and never, it's never clear enough. Uh, so have you dealt with these stories with the, when the Jews and, or Jewish women mostly were rescued because the rescuers kind of uh, use them for, uh, they ask uh, for sex uh, because they couldn't pay and uh, so in some so how do you deal with that do you have interviews like that uh, do you have uh, so how much uh, it was once considered kind of the uh, you know uh, this was also her she was acting to protect usually her children or herself so how how do you deal with these uh, mm -hmm. interviews or with this material because we 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 are not, uh, we don't have those skills yet, yeah. Thank you so much. I want to stress that the, the questions of uh, sexuality during war and genocide is very sensitive and it's very complex issue. In many ways, we have these, you know, gray zones when we are dealing with this question because we know that many Ukraine women and girls and Jewish men, some of Jewish men and boys were trying to use their sexuality and their body as a survival tool uh, in order to save not only them uh, um, themselves, but also their family members. And we know that sometimes, for example, in some ghettos, we have clear signs that Judenrat or family members put pressure on some women, Jewish women, to perform sexual uh, sexual service to to some uh, men in power in order to 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 save the community to protect the community and we know that those women were really traumatized by this experience but they obey actually this pressure and uh, this you know uh, stories like that actually uh, we are very controversial and silence in this meta narrative about the Holocaust because, uh, you know, it was a shame actually to acknowledge that those people are complicit in this sexual trauma actually. They forced in many cases that put they put pressure on the, those women. But also regarding the aid givers actually, we also have many gray zones in many cases. Aid givers abused abuse their power and demanded sexual favors from Jewish women and girls. We have this very prominent story of Molly Applebaum. Her diary was actually uh, published, uh, published recently in, um, um, with the preface of Jan Grabowski. 
And she is telling the story uh, of hiding of herself and her cousin by, by Polish guy, Viktor, who was much um, older than uh, they, uh, they were. She was 13 and I believe her uh, cousin was uh, 16, is, if I'm not mistaken. And they both were engaged in sexual relations with, with him. And this is highly problematic actually, because, to, uh, 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 because we understand that he clearly abuse his position of power and he used those girls sexually but uh, this is a, a more more complex story because molly herself in the interviews given to to uh, recently uh, very um, uh, so she um, she called it entertainment so you know, and the, there was a debate actually between Holocaust scholars and feminist scholars, because it's clear for, for all of us that, you know, if um, a girl is underaged, she can give this clear and conscious consent to the sex, especially during the Holocaust in these circumstances, they were completely dependent on the um, uh, on the victor, you know, but she's trying to, to, you know, to express some agency in this regard, and we should respect her words and how she actually evaluate her experience, but at the same time, we should uh, underline that this is unacceptable, inappropriate. We can't encourage such uh, behavior. And we should underline actually the limited agency of Molly and, uh, and her cousin, because it, it's clear, it's an abuse of power. It, it's very clear. But sometimes, you know, you sometimes you listen to some stories and it's, you know, between the lines actually. You know, especially uh, uh, when the stories are about, uh, you know, aid givers, you know. And uh, um, in my research, I was dealing with some war crimes when um, when women actually in the ghettos and camps, for, for example, or those who were discovered by local policemen, they also use their bodies in order to escape, just uh, escape the death, you know. And during these trials and Soviet investigations, they were trying to prove that what happened to them actually has not has nothing to do with the sex. It was the violence because because of this extreme imbalance of power. That's why when we describe in this story, we should underline this imbalance of power. You know, even if those women agreed to this, you know, um, this the this you know power relations played a very uh, crucial role in all those stories you know and we should keep in mind that many many uh many uh, women in hiding were very vulnerable to uh, some sort of gender based violence and kids as well next next year i um, i will um have uh, I will participate in some conference which is devoted precisely to children and their sexual trauma during the World War II and the Holocaust, and I will reveal those stories because they they are really they are they are really um, very very shocking stories, you know, about the experience of of those girls in hands of uh, aid givers uh, and sometimes even fellow fellow Jewish men in hiding. So we 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 can't cover those story. We should talk about this vulnerability because we still have conflicts. We still have war uh, wars. We still have genocides in different places, and we should be aware of the vulnerability of women, especially and girls in these circumstances and develop some preventive mechanism. Well, thank you so much. Talking about such a difficult and complicated subject and such a, um, I don't know, the educated and um, well thought manner. Thank you, Marta, so much. I really hope this is not our last uh, lecture with you. And uh, just now from Riga, from me, Maya, and the whole Lipka Memorial and everyone else, that we really hope for, you know, victory of Ukraine and that the war will be over and uh, and we will meet already, you know, on the on the in a better, better circumstances. Yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for the invitation. 
Thank you so much for this very important discussion and thank you so much for supporting Ukraine in general and Ukrainian people. Thank, thanks. So and much. this lecture was also supported by Riga municipality that's actually very big support of a Ukrainian cause and uh, is uh, is uh, is uh, are in in trying their best also to assist and help. Okay, so thank you so much and, and hope to see you soon. And thank you, Maya, for, for your lecture. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Be safe. Yeah, bye bye. You too.